The materials for chapter 14 are on the table in the hallway, uh, so you can be prepared for next week. Um, it, we're in chapter 13 of the book of Romans, so if you want to turn there, and uh, we'll be starting there. Uh, Don Padgett uh, said something about saving this until this week. I said, this is the Lord's doing, not mine. I would choose not to have this lesson on this particular day, but uh, we will struggle through it as we try here. Chapter 13 of the book of Romans. And I've titled this particular chapter, Be Submissive. Placing oneself under and remaining under the authority of someone else is very difficult indeed. It's a matter of pride rising within us, just as Satan first resisted God's authority over him. Paul gives us some reasons why we must submit in this chapter. One that is not listed, but very much relates to our study of the gospel is that by disobedience in this area, we will destroy our credibility to present the gospel to the unbeliever. And we're studying the gospel, and that's one of the last things that we would ever want to do is to destroy our credibility to give out the gospel. Well, the first point under being submissive here is that positions of authority are ordained by God. Verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Throughout the world, wherever the gospel has gone, there are different forms of government. They may be tribal, they may be a democracy, they may be a republic, they may be a kingdom or an empire. Each has leadership that is part of them. And believers are to place themselves under the leadership in all things except when that leadership tries to impose itself between the believer and his Lord. Our relationship to Jesus Christ supersedes any other worldly relationship. Christ is very specific about that, even down to the point of family relationships. All these forms of government have been ordained or appointed by God since the time of Noah. He and he alone has the right to set up a ruler and the right to remove a ruler. In two days, we will participate in God's work. Make sure you do it. If you haven't already done it. Okay. In Daniel 4.25, God told uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And so we will find out to whom God is going to give the leadership of our country to. May it be his grace and not his what we deserve. Okay? There's my emphasis to you. <coughs> who to vote for. <laughs> if you are insubordinate to the authority, you will be sinning. 
In verse 2, he says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. As a believer, if we break the law of the government that is over us, we are also breaking the law of God. We have no recourse but to receive the full punishment that the government exercises. Worse than that, we're being, it would be to have God's judgment come upon us for our sin. How does this play out if the government meddles in God's law for us? As the scriptures say, we must obey God rather than men. Will this protect us from the government's punishment? History says maybe yes and maybe no. But as the scripture records back in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. May that be us if the time should come. We're not careful about it. Now that doesn't mean that we're reckless. That means that we're not letting it bother us. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. It may be by death in that furnace, they tell him. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We will obey God. May that be us, no matter what happens in the future to us. Well, what is the proper function of government? And we find that in verses 3 and 4. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now I want you to keep in mind, when is Paul telling these people this? What was the government like? Probably the worst emperor that ever ruled in the Roman Empire was sitting on the throne, Nero himself. And yet he tells them this. So if we have something that's not quite as bad as that, what do we have to complain about? Nothing. All we need to do is to listen to what the Word of God says. There's no perfect form of human government. Why? Because they're all run by sinful human beings. Yet this is God's chosen method for us today. Remember that in the beginning it was not so. It was not until after the flood that human government was instituted. Man had proven that he was unable to control himself when he was left alone to make that decision. So God, for his own protection from others, gave us human government. While human government works some of the time, it is easily corrupted by the evil that is part of the chosen leaders and also the people who are the governed can corrupt it. 
This then becomes a lesson for us to set our minds forward when Jesus Christ will be the head of the government and there will be total peace. Amen. No problem. This is being, this being the case for human government, how should the believer act? We're given two specific commands. What was the first one? Be afraid. Be afraid of them, he says. This does not mean that we cower in the corner of our house with our knees knocking together. This is a time, there's a time attached to this particular command for us. He says, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. We must obey the laws of our government. If we do not, we put ourselves in jeopardy of punishment associated with the law that we violate. The only time that we have license to do this is when the law violates God's specific command for us. However, even in this, we stand in jeopardy of punishment, just not for our sin. Then he also says, be afraid of them, but do that which is good. We have a greater job than just obeying the law. We go further by doing all kinds of good. Human laws mostly state that thou shalt not. The Christian lives a life of good works. Our law states thou shalt do. If you want to turn back to Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 38, I think that at least one of the verses in this section is, is taken out of context and used the wrong way. This is a section concerning legal things. And how do I know that? Well, the very first verse of this section tells us that. It says in Matthew 5, 38, Ye have heard that it hath been said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. This came out of the Hammurabi Code in ancient times. It is not to be taken literally. It never was taken literally in the, in the Jewish situation. It is a principle of punishment set, telling us that the Punishment needs to equal what the crime was and not to be more punishment than what the crime was. Equal for equal is what it's actually telling us. So as we continue here, the next one, this is the verse that seems to be taken out of context. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. That does not mean when you're out there and somebody pokes you in the mouth, you don't turn the other side of your mouth to them. You get out of their way. What it's talking about here is if you deserve to be hit on the, in the, on the cheek, which was a punishment in these days, how do I know? Well, in Acts, Paul was standing before the Sanhedrin and he misspoke to the high priest, not knowing it was the high priest. The high priest wasn't dressed in his robes and things. He didn't know who was high priest then. And so he misspoke to him. And somebody walked up to him and gave him a whack in the face. And Paul said, why did you do that? And he told them, don't you know you're talking to the high priest? And Paul immediately, 
Immediately, he apologized for doing that. It would have been evil for him not to do that. And so he didn't get slapped on the other cheek in this case. So it's like, it's telling us equal for equal. If you deserve to be slapped on the cheek, go further, do more. Let them smack you on the other side just to prove that you are repentant in these things. And then he continues, if any man sue you at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Well, you're being sued because of something you've done. And so they say, okay, I, you, you, I deserve to have your coat. And, Paul, and Jesus saying here, go further on. I mean, if, you, if that is what you deserve, don't just take what you deserve. Go further. Do more. In fact, in the Old Testament law, I mean, you didn't give one thing. You stole a sheep. You didn't give one sheep back. The law told you, you better give five of them back. Do more. Do what's right. He's telling them. And then he says, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with them twain. The Roman law said, A soldier could tell you, pick up my pack and carry it for a mile. Well, if you had picked it up, he said, well, why not walk another mile with them? Gives you that much more time to give them the gospel. Do more. Do that which is good. And then it says, give him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Well, that's also another legal thing here. If a brother in the Old Testament came to you, when he asked to borrow something, he didn't necessarily expect to have to repay it. And that's what Jesus was teaching here. If they need it, give it to them. This does not limit us from exercising our rights under the government in which we live. If you remember in Philippi, Paul and Silas were taken and they were, they were stripped and they were beaten and they were put into jail and, and finally God gets them out of jail and the uh, people that had done this to them, they, they sent some messengers over to the Philippian jailer's house and he said, uh, let's get these people out of here. I, uh, you know, we learned that we did something wrong here and, and we shouldn't have beaten them because they're, they're Roman citizens and, and we don't want to get in trouble with that. So let's, let's sneak them out of town. And Paul tells them to go back and tell them, you come here and take us out yourself. Lead us down the street so that everybody can see that you're repentant of what you did. So you can see there's a difference here. If we do something wrong, let's do more than what's just required of us to pay it back. Let's do good in all the things. But first of all, let's make sure that we're not guilty of anything. That's what our basic lesson is about. Well, we need to Keep ourselves pure. In Romans 13, 5, he says, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. When we are busy doing good works, we have no need to fear the government. We need to keep our consciences clean. It's in the quiet hours when it's the sins that we commit that the conscience drags up in our thoughts. 
we will never lose any sleep over the good works that we do. Do good works. I don't know how many times I've seen that in the scriptures. Do good works. Get back in James. Pops up every other verse, I think, in James. Well, examples of proper submission. Here is that nasty word, submission. Right? We've, we went over that when we were in uh, First Peter. I'm just reading that again, and so it just reminds me that we're, we're to be submissive to a lot of people, but, but of course it's the government that we're talking about here. We just don't like to be under someone else's authority. I want to be my own boss. But we as believers have confessed that Jesus is Lord and have placed ourselves under his authority. He in turn has told us that we must be also submissive to others. And Paul gives us some practical ways that we can do this. How to submit to the human government. Verses 6 and 7. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. We've already looked at the purpose of human government. However, here it is emphasized that the government official, the word minister here, which is not the same word as servant that is used in verse 4. It means it is God's public official. And he has every right to receive the tribute in a similar way that the priests in the Old Testament had the right to be provided for through the sacrifices. Now, other than obeying the laws, what else are we responsible for? Paying tribute, your taxes. I mean, we could have saved this until, uh, what, when, when is it? April 15th. Pay your taxes. Oh. Terrible. <laughs> These are dues that are owed and must be paid. They are due to this person. They must be paid. Makes me a little upset, you know, I got these commercials about... Uh, you know, these tax relief companies, you know, we'll, we'll help you, you know. How on earth did you ever get that far behind in your taxes in the first place? I can understand when it comes to the end of the year and, and something unusual has happened during the year. It's happened to me well, the last few. I wind up, you know, you have to pay at the end. You know, you push that last button on the computer and... Oh, I owe that much money. Yeah, you owe it. So you better get the checkbook out and write the check and send it in with the taxes. Okay. So that's what we're talking about, the taxes. The taxes that go to the government. And then it says to pay custom. Well, these are the indirect taxes. On, that are put on the goods. That's your sales taxes. If you live in Europe, it's the VAT taxes, value added taxes. These are taxes that the government has the right to place on the goods that you buy and that you sell. So what are we to do? If we're in that position, you pay it. When I check out at Walmart, that don't have any question about it. It's already included in the final thing. 
don't like it. You know, I mean, it's nice in Pennsylvania. They don't charge me that on clothes and on uh, most foods. But when I'm in other places, oh, we've got taxes on food in Florida. We've got taxes on clothes when I buy them. Okay, I'm going to pay them. Because why? Because the government says I had to pay them? No. I'm going to pay them why? Because God said pay the taxes. And that's why I will pay the taxes. And then the third thing is, he says to pay fear. We should stand in awe of those who wear the sword. I don't know, you know, when the police officer walks up to you and says something and you look down and he has the sword attached to his belt. There should be a little bit of fear. You know, I hope I really didn't do anything wrong. Okay. <clears throat> Since the execution of their office is suited to excite fear, we should render to them that reverence which is appropriate to execution of their function. So when the police officer walks up to my car, I don't reach in my glove compartment and pull out a gun. I don't reach out and grab his gun. Does this sound familiar in the recent days? I don't throw something at him. As a believer, I show fear and a respect for that fear. I say, yes, sir. No, sir when it comes time. That's why when we begin to exceed the speed limit, whether purposefully or ignorantly, we start looking for the smoky in the bushes. And every car that's Broken down along the side of the road, we begin to think, oh, is that a police car? I better, I better look. What speed am I going? Okay. You know, even if you got it, got the speed thing set, you're still a little worried, you know, am, am I exceeding what I should be? Well, the final one there was to pay honor. The difference between this and fear is that this rather denotes reverence or veneration and respect for their names, for their offices, and for their rank. And this is why we say your honor when we stand before the judge. And why we say Mr. President if we have the opportunity to stand before him. And why if we lived under the monarchy, we would bow our heads and say, your majesty. I'm looking forward to the day I can do that. When I say to Lord Jesus, your majesty. We may not be able to respect them as a person because of the vile lives that they live. But that makes no difference in this case because God has placed them in their position and we honor them so that we can honor God. I'm sure Paul, when he stood before Nero, did not say, something derogatory to him.
Remember, this is a way that we submit to God's authority as well as to the government. Well, how to submit to one another comes up next. In the verse 8, we're going to find how do you submit? Get out of debt and stay out of debt. He says, oh, no, man, anything. Now, don't let the next word make you think that that means I can get away with some other stuff. What did he just say? Oh, no, man. What? Anything. You see, the but is really not telling us we can get away with it. The but really means except to do what? To do something else. Remember, we're always taught, do the good, not the wrong, do the good. Except to what? Love one another. This command literally saying, stop owing even one person even one thing except to love one another. This should be a goal for each of us. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. When you are saddled with debt, you are not free to love one another to the fullest extent you are less able to supply the needs of others. And how many times have we been told that that's what we need to be able to do? If a brother is in need, true religion is this, if a brother is in need and he comes to you, do you send him away with a rock to eat? Jesus tells him, no. You supply the need. And when you are in debt, you cannot have all the ability that you need to do that job for Jesus Christ. How do we stay out of debt? There are things that I need, I keep saying, but always stop to think. Is this thing what I really need, or is it something I want? The scriptures speak clearly to answer this question. In Luke 3, 14, John's baptizing, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. The soldiers were notorious for taking things from people, either forcefully or by using the law by falsely accusing someone of a crime. They were noted for their gambling. (laughs) Look at what they did under Jesus' cross. In order to attain more, John tells them to stop doing these things and to be content with what they were being paid. Paul tells us, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And then Hebrews Chapter 13, 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, desiring more, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I keep trying to get rid of more and more stuff. He's all I need. And he told me he will provide. 
Don't know how the provision will come sometimes, but he will provide. We got to stop there. I can't even get finished with a short chapter like chapter 13. Brother Dan, we got a song coming up.